Random errors propagate multiple ways. We'll talk how that works here with the errors of a series, the errors of a sum, and the error of redundant measurement. Error of a series is the process we use when we're describing the error of multiple measurements that have identical standard deviations. For instance, let's say you are measuring a 1,000 foot line with a steel tape, a 100 foot long steel tape. Every time you lay down that tape, you should, if you're using good methods, have the same error, the same accumulation of error per 100 foot tape length. So let's look here at the equation. We're saying the error of a series is equal to plus or minus the error times the square root of the number of applications. Just remember here, when we use the big letter E, that's a generic form of error, and a more specific form of error is expressed as a standard deviation. Let's consider a control level circuit that has 64 rod readings. All the rod readings were made to the nearest one hundredth of a foot. That is, the error in each reading could be plus or minus 0 0.005 feet. Now that doesn't mean that every error is 0 0.005. It could be 0 0.001 or 0 0.004 but we're simply saying that when we do rounding and a reading we are inducing an error of up to 0 0.005. Our question is for reading errors only what is the total error that would be expected in the elevation of the ending benchmark? Now if we oversimplify this, we'll of course lie to ourselves, we could say oh 64 rod readings times a half of a hundredth of a foot 0 0.005 that works out to be 0.32 feet and that's not reasonable because that assumes that all the errors have the same sign and the same size. Well that's not really the case because some of the errors will cancel each other out. Some will be positive, some will be negative. Some of them will be a half a hundred, some of them will be a tenth of a hundred or a thousandth of a foot. So we are looking for the composite effect of all of these errors whose sizes and signs are randomly distributed. So let's see what we do. We take that error of 0 0.005 and we apply it over 64 readings using the formula we saw just a little bit ago. So the error is plus or minus 0 0.005. The, the square root of 64 readings in this case goes in there and when we crunch the number we find out that's plus or minus 0 0.04 feet and that is the error in the elevation at the ending benchmark just attributable to rod reading errors. So this is an error of a series solution. Why did we apply this? Because the same error occurs 64 times. Now the second one we want to talk about is the error of a sum. Simply put, the square root of the sum of the errors of each of the individual measurements squared. So for each individual measurement, there is an error. And we square each error and we take the square root of the sum of all of those errors. We apply this when we have multiple unique error sources. You see, in the previous example, error of a series, we talked about uh, identical error sources. Now we have unique error sources that have potentially differing standard deviations. You may have two error sources that have the same numeric standard deviation, numeric value, but because they are from different sources then we would treat them uh, with this particular method, the error of a sum. So let's apply this uh, to something that we deal with on a regular basis. Our scenario here is we have measured a distance of 3609.14 feet using a total station and, and a fixed target. There are multiple error sources in this and the first one we want to talk about is how the electronic distance meter has an accuracy of plus or minus three millimeters plus three parts per million. Now this type of expression uh, for distance error has what we call a constant error 
and a scalar error. The constant error occurs in every measurement. And then the three parts per million, we say it's scalar. That is, it scales up or down with distance. That is, the longer the distance, the greater the effect it's going to have. A part per million simply means one part error per one million parts of measurement. Let me give you an example. If you measure one kilometer at one part per million, then your error would only be one millimeter. Uh, in miles, a 5,280 foot long mile, well, a part per million is just under a half of a hundredth of a foot per mile. We have not only our EDM uh, accuracy, but the instrument centering error is, we've estimated it to be plus or minus two millimeters. What do we mean here? Well, when you set the instrument up using the tri-brac over the point, the tri-brac can be out of calibration. And my experience is once you've got it calibrated to within about a millimeter, it's hard to adjust on your own. We accept that there's going to be some centering error. Likewise, let's say your target is on a prism pole and you've got a bipod holding that prism pole. Well, how accurate is the bubble in the prism pole? Let's give it a conservative estimate and say our centering error is plus or minus four millimeters. So here's our scenario graphically. We have the instrument on the left and we've got an error ellipse there indicating we're at plus or minus two millimeters for centering. We've got the constant and scalar error of three millimeters and three parts per million in our distance of 3609.14 feet. And then over at the target on the right we have a centering error of plus or minus four millimeters. Now let's start by looking at the, uh, at the distance uh, error which includes the three millimeters and three parts per million. Before we do this, we really ought to convert into metric because our errors are expressed in in millimeters, you know, subunits of a, of a meter. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to assume we're working in U.S. survey feet here. And the official conversion from U.S. survey feet to meters is like you see here. So here we have 12 inches per foot, we know that to be true, and the official relationship of U.S. survey feet to meters is there are 39.37 inches in every meter. This gives you this great big long number, which I suggest you never try to memorize. You're always better off just using this ratio of 12 inches uh, per foot and then 39.37 39 inches per meter. So when we apply this, it's just that ratio of 12 to 39.37 that we'll use. And we're going to convert the 3,609.14 feet to 1,100.068 meters. So you can see that up here at the top now. That is our distance. And that will become important for calculating our scalar error. So here's how we do that. Remember, 3 millimeters is our constant error and three parts per million is the scalar error. So how do we do this? We take three parts per million, that is three divided by one million, and we're going to multiply that times our distance. Well, our distance here we said was 1100.068 meters, so you can see the numbers come out to be 0 0.0033 meters, or really that's 3.3 millimeters. That is our scalar error. So the scalar error is going to be one of four inputs that we put into our error of a sum. And here we have them. The first one we've got listed here, squared, just like the formula showed us, is the instrument centering error. Then we have our target centering error of four millimeters. Our EDM constant error is three millimeters. And then our scalar error that we just calculated a moment ago is 3.3 millimeters. We square each of these errors and take the square root of the sum of the squares. And here we can see our result is plus or minus 6.3 millimeters. That is the standard deviation in our measured line. 
So when we describe this line, we remember that it has two components, the measurement itself and then the uncertainty statement. We are expressing our uncertainty statement as a standard deviation that has a 68.3% confidence. Now when we talk about angular errors, especially with optical instruments, we need to really use two methods. We're going to use error of a sum and we're going to use the error of redundant measurement. Now first thing I want to point out is that the least count on your instrument is not the precision. I remember bumping into uh, another survey crew from a competing company on a job site years ago. It's one of those jobs where there was uh, multiple contractors that had their own surveyors. So we had two different surveying companies working on the same site. We were just chatting it up a little bit at the beginning of the day and they're asking what kind of instrument we're running and and they pointed to theirs that was set up on a tripod nearby and said, yeah, it's a one-second instrument. Really? Oh, okay. Well, I just kind of made a mental note of the, of the model on the instrument and went, went, went and looked it up later online and found out that, no, it was not a one-second instrument. It was probably a five-second instrument, if I remember correctly. But why, why would they call it a one-second instrument? Well, my guess is they were probably looking at the screen and realizing that it, it, its least count, that is, it's the way it incremented angles, was one second at a time. The least count is not the precision of the instrument. The instrument angular precision is specified by ISO standard 17123-3. That's from the International Organization of Standardization. Um, and you can look up their website there, uh, iso.org. And the standard, I've paraphrased here just a little bit, says theodolite precision is expressed as the standard deviation of a horizontal direction observed once in both face positions of the telescope. Okay, now let's understand what it means by a direction. If we've got our instrument over here on the left, a direction is merely one pointing at one target. We're not turning any angles at this point. You could set up the instrument, not even set zero to it, point it at a target, and do that in direct mode, or some call it face one, and then do it again in reverse mode, or other, otherwise known as face two, and the precision, if it's a five second instrument, is the standard deviation of those two pointings and that standard deviation is plus or minus five seconds. Okay, now we haven't turned an angle at all yet, but we have established a direction with two pointings, one in face one, one in face two, or otherwise known as direct and reverse. Let's apply this to an angle. We're going to say, we're going to turn this angle with direct and reverse method. That is, we're going to back sight in direct, and then back sight in reverse, and then foresight in reverse, and then foresight in direct. So here we go. We've got the same con condition we had before. We've got a direction to the back sight, and then we measure the direct and reverse to the foresight, and now the way the definition works, this is a standard deviation of plus or minus five seconds at each of these. Well, that affects the angle between these, and the way we express that is by using the error of a sum. Notice down here that we've got five seconds that occurred at the back sight. We've got five seconds that occurred at the foresight. You might say, well, those are the same error. Well, they might be numerically the same, but one is at a different location than the other. Therefore, these are unique errors. See that? So we uh, square the sum of the squares, or take the square root of the sum of the squares, and we get a standard deviation in the single angle measured in direct and reverse mode of seven seconds. That is our standard deviation. Okay, well this is with a five second instrument. 
So why aren't we getting five seconds? Well, we haven't satisfied the criteria for achieving five seconds yet. And we do that with redundant measurement. So if a measurement is repeated multiple times, the accuracy increases even if the measurements have the same value. So the formula here, the error in the redundant measurement is plus or minus the error itself uh, that's repeated divided by the square root of the repetitions. Okay, so let's take a look and see how that we apply this. If our first angle measured with one set, direct or in reverse, was seven seconds, we're going to take that seven seconds and we're going to apply it because if we do another set at seven seconds, well, we're taking that seven seconds and dividing it by now two sets, the square root of two sets. And that gives us plus or minus five seconds of precision. So here's the deal. If you say your instrument has uh, a precision, a stated precision of five seconds, you're not going to get five second precision from that until you have to turned two sets direct and reverse. Okay? Two sets direct and reverse. Now if you turn three sets, here's what happens. Now we've got square root of three in the denominator, and now this rounds to four seconds. If you go to four sets, you can squeeze that down to three and a half seconds because you've got square root of four in the denominator. At really at three sets of angles, you are at a point of diminishing returns in terms of your gain in precision. Now, let's think about this, how it affects different accuracies. Here we've got a five second total station, a three second total station, and a two second total station. So with a five second total station, if we turned one set uh, of direct and reverse to measure one angle, we got seven seconds. We got five seconds when we turned two sets. But if you turn direct only, direct only, the error in your angle is going to be 10 seconds. Okay? So you don't get five second accuracy by turning one angle. You've got to turn two sets direct and reverse to get that. Likewise, for a three second instrument, it takes two sets direct and reverse. You double that to get the error in a single angle measured in direct mode only. So to summarize, with errors of a sum or errors of a series, each additional variable, that is each additional error source, increases the total error of the network or of your system or whatever you're trying to evaluate here. However, when you have errors of redundant measurement, each redundant measure decreases the error in your network or system of measurements. This will become especially valuable as you get into least squares adjustments and this is the key for achieving good network precision especially when you're going to adjust with least squares methods.